scriptures in uh, Romans chapter 14 today. Uh, we were, uh, several months ago, we made reservations to go uh, up north, and we flew up on uh, United right after they tried to rip that guy off. <laughs> So you kind of look around when you get on the plane, see if there's any bad guys. Then, uh, while we were there, they had an incident where the people, uh, I guess they beat up on a lady with a stroller. That was on American Airlines, and that's when we flew back American Airlines. So we had sort of an interesting flight. We did Delta, they've had troubles now, but um, we fortunately didn't have any trouble. We missed the flight. There was a delay in Traverse City, and when there's a delay in Traverse City, um, that's a big problem when you get to Chicago because we had 55 minutes to get from one gate to the other and we started 30 or 35 minutes late and uh, Gene ran over there because I was waiting for them to get the bags off and they had already locked the gate and they wouldn't let her on and she, well she didn't do anything else but anyhow, uh, so we had to wait another couple hours to get on and while we were waiting in the uh, area where they set you up, there was this one particular lady with this one particular boy, a little boy, uh, probably two years old, I guess he was, and uh, he was screaming through the whole, you know, she'd take him his hair and scream and scream. And you know what I'm talking about? You ever heard a little kid scream? Yes. So we got on the uh, airplane and uh, here comes the lady with her uh, little boy. And uh, Gene said, I think she's going to sit right here. <laughs> Which we were looking forward to being Christians and all. <laughs> but unfortunately, she sat in the row right in front of us. So, um, as it worked out, the little kid and I kind of uh, we bonded and we made friends. We played pick and pick and boo. He's probably thinking, boy, that's a big dumb guy back there. <laughs> anyway, we played peak movement, and his mother, she was, I felt sorry for the poor dear, but we got to the airport 10 or 15 minutes early, and uh, the captain came on and said, we can't get off the plane yet because there's nobody, there's no ground crew here, so we can't get to the, get to the ramp. It's going to be about a 15 minute wait. So, the lady uh, in front of me, she's front of Gene and I, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it or not, but she was getting real pale, and so I, they had those bags, you know what the bags are for, I handed her a bag, she may need this, and sure enough, <laughs> that added to the joy of the trip, <laughs> but of course being good Christians, we didn't say anything, <laughs> and so finally on the way out, we finally did get movement on the way out, and I said to the stewardess, um, there's a throw up on aisle 30. <laughs> I thought that was a Christian thing to do. So anyway, she went, she made a funny face. But uh, I left and got out of there. <laughs> so that was kind of our trip. We finally got back here at midnight, or 1 o'clock in the morning. So it was kind of a long flight. But uh, we're, we're in Romans. Last week, or a couple weeks ago, before Easter, we talked about Romans in Romans uh, 14, about do not judge one another. And remember the story there, they were having trouble uh, uh, getting along, trying to see who was going to be, if you did this was good or that was good. And in verse 8 it says, For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. When we come to know Christ, we are the Lord's. It's not like an option. Either you are or you are not. And when you, once you do that, uh, then you begin to live that life out. And then in verse 12 it says, So that each of, one of us, shall give an account of himself to God. The idea is that's not a salvation account, that's an account of, your, of what you've done, the works that you've done for God. You present those to Christ, and you'll, you'll say, he'll say, how, oh, yeah, that's good, that's good, or someone would just be burnt up. How will God do that? How will Jesus do that? Well, this is a speculation. And before the, uh, we had computers and stuff, they probably didn't really think about that, but when we, we have the most amazing computer right here on top of our uh, shoulders. Um, maybe you haven't figured that out yet, but it is. And as a result of that, when we come before God, He's going to push your button, the reset button, and He's going to, you're going to spew out the stuff of your life. The, the works that you did are going to be presented to God. The ones that burn up. And it says, so we're going to, each one of us, each one of us individually will give an account for oneself. 
You won't give an account for your brother, or your sister, your mother, your daughter, or son. You're going to give an account for yourself. And so he begins to make us realize that we need to be people that that are people that live uh, not judging one another, but living out our life for God. And then the next part of it in, in verse 13 on through the end of the chapter, therefore, verse left, therefore, verse 13, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in the brother's way. So he's, he, Paul says, don't put a, some, something in front of a brother or a sister that's going to make them fall or stumble. And, and the things that they're arguing about here, they're not arguing about the doctrines of the church. They're not arguing about those things that are put in, into place. They're arguing about the food that they eat. Because the Levitical law says you ate this. And, in, and when Paul says in the New Testament, in a, under Christ, everything is clean. There's nothing that's unclean. So we don't make judgments. But the, what was happening in the Roman church, there were some Jews that had come in along with the Gentiles. And then this discussion, should I be a vegetarian, can I eat meat, can I not eat meat, do I eat fish on Friday, whatever it happens to be, whatever the argument is, they just, they said, don't judge them you, if it's clean to you, but if the other person is weaker, then don't do it in front of them. Okay? And that's the idea. He says, so don't put a stumbling block or obstacle in a brother's way. And so we're, we're to be sure that we look out. Uh, for our, our brother or sister. I know in verse 14, and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So those are the kind of things that we have to think about. We, we want to say here, this is what, the way it is. This is the way it is. In the doctrinal issues of the church, there, this is the way it is. But in the ancillary things, things like food and that sort of thing, that's not really... Uh, big. For if... If because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy him with your food, him for whom Christ died. No matter who that person is, Christ died for him or for her. We, we don't select, we don't select, say, oh, you know, I don't think God really or Jesus really died for that person over there. Well, the Bible teaches us that he died for all. And what we do with that is a decision that you and I have to make individually in our lives. I can't make the decision for you. You can't make the decision for me. It's an individual decision. So we need to be people that love, that love that person and that we respect that person and that we minister to that person even though we think what they're eating is wrong. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. I know a lot of times, uh, uh, I, I was raised in Methodist church, I was a Methodist pastor, and we never did anything without eating. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> we do that quite a bit here too, by the way, so. But it's not, it's, you may be surprised about this, but the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. But, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The church is about, the kingdom of God is about righteousness. Are we living a righteous life? Are we living a life that is honest before God? Are we living a life that reaches out to others and that we're able to live our life in a way that glorifies God? Are we living a life that is peaceful? Peaceful. Peaceful. I know some places it's not peaceful. It can be great disturbances. But are we living a life as a, as a body of belief, believers? Are we righteous people? And are we peaceful people? Peaceful. And peaceful. And then out of the peace comes the third thing, joy. Joy. Are we joyous people? Now, the truth of the matter is that we can't do any of those things on our own. We can't be righteous. We're not necessarily going to be peaceful and certainly probably not joyful on our own. So Paul goes on to say, in, in the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that inhabits us, that brings us into righteousness, that brings us to peace, and brings us to joy. If we will be people that follow and are led by the Holy Spirit, we can live this life out into the world. We can live it into the group that we are. We don't have to be 
We don't have to be judgmental because we are empowered by the very God, by the God of the universe himself. In verse 18, for he who is, for he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Isn't that an interesting uh, thought? If we're righteous, if we're peaceful, and if we're joyful in the Holy Spirit, we're not only acceptable to God, but to man. Isn't it? That's amazing, isn't it? Because, now, I don't like to talk about myself too often, but I can be really annoying. And I don't know if that's really acceptable to God. I try not to do that, but I've gotten better over the years. But, um, don't tell me my wife I admitted to being annoying because she'll hold it over my head. But, um, isn't that the truth of how we live our lives? But, but he says, Paul says that righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit makes our behavior acceptable to God and to man. Isn't that amazing? Now think about how if we really lived that out as we went about our life, what an impact that would have on others. So verse 19, so let, then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. So we, Paul encourages us to pursue to pursue the things that make for peace and the building up of one another. So not only are we peaceable people, but we're building up those that we encounter, that we're encouraging those that we encounter, that we lift them up as they take the walk of faith. Because the walk of faith needs, we need to be encouraged as we go along with that. Some days that can be really a difficult struggle to say, well, I don't know if this is really worth staying on this. I don't really know if it's worth staying on this path. But the Bible teaches us, and if we will be, right, be peaceful and righteous, and if we do that, that God will care for us. God will care for us. And so as we do that, as we live our life out, that affects those that we encounter. That affects those that we come across in our lives. That they're able to be encouraged in the midst of difficulties. Verse 20, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. So we're not to be tearing that down. Verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. So we're, we're to watch the things that we do so we don't cause our brother to stumble. Um, Uh, I, I had a brother-in-law, uh, I don't have him anymore, he left my sister, but my brother-in-law was a really good man. He was an unbelievable carpenter, Finnish carpenter, he, he was unbelievable. And as long as he didn't touch, touch any alcohol, he was fine. If he had one drink, whether it was beer or whiskey, whatever, if he had one drink, he was going to drink until they kicked him out of the bar or drank a bowl of the alcohol. One of the things that we would do when Ron was around, we wouldn't, everybody have a drink and drink, drink, drink while well, he sat inside. Because if he could ease him, one drink, listen to me, one drink would cause him to not, to not be able to walk home or get home. We, we do that in front of people, sometimes maybe not intentionally, but we do that. And as a result, we cause a brother or a sister to stumble. And so we really need the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we eat, the things that we drink, all those things. He does eating and drinking here because it's, that's kind of an obvious thing and that was one of the battles. But we do other things in our life that we, we cause people to stumble because we don't really, aren't really interested in them to be in peace and to encourage them and to move them forward. The faith you have, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. So you and I need to be people that have convictions about the things that we do. I, I was a drinker. 
I know that doesn't seem possible, but I was. I have not had a drink for 33 years. That's the power of God. The power of God that empowered me to be able to put it aside. I can go places, I can be in places where people drink, and I'm not affected by that anymore. For a long time, it was not easy. But I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, it, to me, it is a hazard in our lives. And we need to be careful that we don't cause other people to stumble in whatever it is that we do that causes them to, to go off on uh, their tangent. So Paul, Paul's writing this to the, to the Roman church. The basic thing that I think he's saying is that uh, righteousness uh, and peace and joy are what the kingdom of God is about. And that's being empowered by the Holy Spirit. We, we cannot live those, we cannot live in righteousness and peace and joy without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When we try to do it ourselves, it just breaks down. It breaks down. I, I want to encourage you today to think about, about areas in your life. And again, this I'm not thinking about the area in your life. This isn't for me to say. This isn't for your wife or your husband to say or your neighbor. This is what, what God is impressing upon your life, how you should respond and react in situations that you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. How, how do you react? How do you, do you do it with encouragement? Do you do it with righteousness? Do you do it with peace? Do you do it with joy? Or do you try to straighten everybody out? I'm not against straightening people off on my specialty, but sometimes it's not really necessary. It's my own, it's my own power that's doing it, not the power of God. Let's be, let's be people that pray, that then we, we respond and we encourage people to take a step in the right direction. We're not an obstacle that they stumble over and fall. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to gather together. We thank you for the righteousness, the joy, the peace that you give us in the Holy Spirit. Father, help us to live that out in our lives, because what an amazing way to live, that we not only are pleasing to you, but that we're pleasing to our fellow man. What a, what a great, what a great uh, situation that is, to live our life in that sort of peace and joy and righteousness. So we praise you, we honor you. Father, we love you. And we just ask today that you would bless us as we go and encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, something. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high.